but we're happy that she's home, and that's the first step, and we're, we're glad for that. Yes, Jane. Yeah, Kathy also, she wants confidence. Yes. If anybody wants to do this, please do. She really needs confidence. Absolutely. She would greatly appreciate it. And uh, uh, she, she definitely just uh, appreciates the Sunshine Group and, and prayers and cards. And, and she needs it because this, this back here led to she was really down, and who wouldn't be after coming home and then having to go back? But, but remember her, absolutely. Um, Phyllis, we want to keep her in prayer too today, is going in for outpatient surgery for cancer. And uh, we, uh, we want to remember her as uh, it's something that they feel is, they can take care of there, but it's uh, outpatient, and that is Tuesday morning in Clinton County. So we want to remember Phyllis uh, in our prayers, absolutely. Uh, Edna is starting to get a little, a little improvement from the pneumonia that she's had. Dave, you have an update on her? And still, still doing rehab a little bit. Uh, absolutely. And please, not just end up, Ray needs prayers. Uh, he's worn out, and it's really just drained him physically and emotionally, too. Uh, and Edna does not want to be at Laurel's. Uh, she wants to be home, but it is probably one of the best places for her there. And, and so that situation definitely needs to be lifted up and filled off. Uh, had his port put in Thursday and next or Friday, I'm sorry, and then next Thursday they begin cancer treatment uh, for Phil. So we want to remember that uh, and him and our prayers uh, as well. Um, and, and, and the list in general, if there are any updates, additions, please let us know. I, I'm not trying to leave anyone on purposely at, at all. We just wanted to make mention uh, of those. But uh, let's let's remember them uh, in prayer uh, as we go to the Lord together this morning to, to begin so. so like, oh, wait a minute. No, this is in the hand. I'm sorry. Let's, we need to sign for auction. I don't know. There you go. All right. Yeah, Leroy's cancer surgery is Thursday. This Thursday, yes. And that is in Cleveland. Cleveland. So we want to remember Leroy, absolutely. And he has come through so far so good. And we're happy to, to see that. And we, we hopefully uh, things go well. So we'll be lifting uh, Leroy up in prayer. So uh, let's go together to the Lord as we remember these days and, and others uh, this morning. Father, as we gather together, we just praise you for being such uh, a loving God. You love us so much, even the moments we're unlovable. Uh, we, as, as simple as we are still, and, and we mess up and, and stumble, uh, you are there with arms wide open, and your grace is amazing, and your love is amazing. And Father, as we seek you this morning, we kind of gather together as, as believers of like faith. We, we just want to lift up praise to you, recognize who you are, what you do for us, and may we have uh, hearts and minds that are prepared not only to, to receive what your word has to say to us, Father, but knowing the responsibility we have to live it in our daily lives. And as we read the prayer list of needs and concerns and upcoming surgeries or those recovering from illness, Father, even the unspoken requests, we all uh, have uh, those names on our hearts. We, we just lift them up to you. And as always, we just pray that if there is someone or maybe a family who does not know who you are as their Savior, who, who has not before looked to you at all, may in these moments they see the importance of what you provide and the importance of having a relationship with you. Father, there's no greater decision man could ever make than to accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. And may we as New Vienna Church of Christ and all we plan and outreach and activities, what we plan to, and, and do and say, may we point people to who you are and bring glory to your name. Bless the service. Uh, thank you for all that we have and all that we're able to do uh, not only in our individual lives, but, but just as you bless this church and, and, and how many years it's been in existence and, and to see your work through the years, may we have open hearts to allow you to work through us and, and pick up where so many have left off. We, we, we just love you. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray and all of God's people say. Amen. 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 There's a couple of quick announcements before we, we, we move forward. Uh, 56 Sunday School. So hopefully we can, we can bring that back up. Listen again, I, I will... I hammer this, our Sunday school teachers prepare lessons, and, and, and the reason being, we need more than just an hour of, of being in God's Word. And these are the moments where we are built up, uh, we're encouraged, and, and it's just an opportunity to be further, you know, to just know God's Word and, and what it means to us. So I encourage you, please, uh, make an effort to, to be here at Sunday School 930, all of our teachers, and the job they do, and they just be around one light came on, what's going on? Okay. <laughs> Uh, God was telling me something. Uh, so remember remember that. And uh, Rita Davidson uh, has a thank you card, uh, not only for all the cards she received, but a, a gift from the Sunshine Group. She had a, a spot removed that was cancerous. She's out of the woods, taking an antibiotic right now, and so she's doing much better, but we're very happy to, to hear that. We'll post that card uh, for her. So um, 
this month is very important on Sunday mornings, and you'll notice just a little different way we're doing things this morning. This is, this is a smidge. And the reason for it is, is the purpose. This month, we are really diving into the Lord's Prayer. And there are four ingredients to that prayer that I believe God gives us as a model to include in our prayer lives. And I want us, when we think of elders and deacons, uh, who's being nominated, when we think of repairs around the church or just the prayer list, uh, and, and other things, we all need to be engaged in prayer. Prayer is a powerful thing God gives us, and it's a privilege. And hopefully, as this month progresses, uh, we see that and become a church and a people of prayer. And, 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 and that is our goal uh, this month. So with that being said, Ken, I know you have some, some other announcements. Good morning. Good morning. Just a few short announcements for you. Wednesday night, it will be the second Wednesday of the month. We'll be kicking off our Wednesday night activities for the youth that will be going once a month with them. Six o'clock for any of the youth that want to come. We'll have supper here, and then we'll have games and devotion time. So if you can be here at 6 o'clock Wednesday night, you um, come out, share some time with us, and enjoy. Candy. We still need a lot of candy for trunk and treat. Um, so go ahead and start bringing that in. We'll also need some people to help with painting the buildings that we've got that we're setting up and everything, too, which we'll have more information on that. The time when we get together, and just help paint and then set up everything on that night. Um, as many of you know, we always take high school kids and during the summer to a week at Cleveland, Tennessee for CIY move. Um, just a quick recap of what this little two-month event does. They had 23,000 students attend the Senior High Move Conference this year. That's up from approximately 21,000 from last year. Out of those 23,000, they had 840 first-time decisions for Christ, 3,781 rededications, 1,576 decisions for youth to move into vocational ministry, and 6,353 decisions from students to dedicate their lives to a kingdom work. So 55% of those that attendance made some kind of a Christ-centered decision for their lives. And a couple of those were from our church. We had a couple of rededications. We had a couple that had decided they wanted to do their king, give their life to a kingdom work and do something for the kingdom. So it is important to um, keep said, uplift these youth and encourage them to continue to do what they're doing and to go the way that they're going. They did a great job up here last week. I was really proud of them and the guys that came up and spoke. So continue to encourage them when you see them and just talk to them about the CIY move because I think they all went. So um, they can tell you a lot of things and it is a good organization and they do get something out of it. So that, that's all I got. So let's go ahead and greet one another.
then they uh, say that, I think this came from Australia, maybe Boomerang did, and the uh, primitive tribesmen there in Australia, they use it as, as a hunting club. Uh, so they must have been pretty good with uh, knowing actually how to, to throw and everything. <clears throat> it has a very effective uh, aerodynamic design that causes it to, when you throw it, it'll circle around and come back to you. Up serving back to you, uh, return to the thrower. Uh, you can trust the wind and aerodynamic laws to return it each time. There's something there that some way it's made it brings it back to you. Well, you can trust God also to return what is given. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, beginning with 17, 17 through the 19th verses we read. <clears throat> By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. <coughs> It's kind of marvel at Abraham's faith, do The tremendous faith he had. He was willing to kill and burn his son on an altar as a sacrifice to God. But Abraham's faith made perfect sense to him. It's hard to believe, but it made perfect sense to Abraham. He looked past the gift and saw that saw the power of God to return the promised son from the dead. As I have to say, we're amazed at Abraham's faith, but I wonder if he would marvel at our faith, trusting in God. We place our trust in the aerodynamic principle that a boomerang, an airplane, will fly. We get on an airplane, we trust that it's going to go up the air, and it's going to fly. Well, sometimes you wonder how it's keep, what keeps it up there. Well, uh, we trust in that, but we hesitate sometimes when given the opportunity to, to place faith in God. God promises to supply our needs if we honor Him with our offerings. He promises to bless your generosity to bless you generously for your generosity that you give to him. As Abraham did, we need to look past the gift and see the power of God to return. Express your faith in God by giving this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, there's many things that we don't understand, things that you created and each day we learn something new. But Father, we know that we can trust in you. And sometimes we falter in our faith. We just pray for forgiveness for that. And be able to put our full trust in you because you will return what has been given to you. <coughs> Father, we thank you this time that we can bring our tithes and offerings into your storehouse. They might be used to further the work in your kingdom. May blessing, your blessing be upon both the gift and the giver. Thank you for loving us and caring for us and providing for us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
commanded. You are an amazing God. And, and may every day we just thank you for being who you are and the love you have for us. And as we come before you this time, Father, we, we want to thank you for providing for us every day. Whether it is in great ways you show your love or care, or even in subtle ways you just remind us that you are present in our lives and want to take care of us as a Heavenly Father takes care of his children. Thank you for such love. And dear Lord, I know that when we think of, of your forgiveness, we think of grace, we, we stumble and fall daily, but we think of what you've done for us through your son's death, that we have an advocate, to know we can seek forgiveness of our sins, we confess those sins and we find mercy and, and forgiveness in you. And Father, I just pray that daily we live our lives in a way that pleases you, to know that we face temptations and, and situations come into our lives and we want to make sure we handle it properly. And that we seek your word daily to, to put on your armor and to shine your light for all to see. And dear Lord, there are many names mentioned this morning on the prayer list and so many needs and concerns. But you're the great physician for a reason. And my prayer is that we just ask that your hand be upon them. And we find peace and comfort, strength and grace you promise us in your word as your children. So Father, we thank you and we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Our next hymn is hymn number 83. <coughs> hymn number 83, we'll be singing it twice through.
and contact Him in prayer at any time in the inmost depth of our being. Our relationship with God, though, has to be transcendent. You know, it's going beyond the horizontal dimension, elevating us to contemplate the Most High and to give Him the glory, which is due our Creator. The thanksgiving which we owe our Most Holy Father in Heaven. Adoring the Lord is more than just loving Him. It is being captivated with who He is. Adoration is looking beyond what the Lord has done for us and gazing into His face. When we do this, life's problems then are seen from a heaven's perspective. Adoration, though, is also a heart response, a recognition that He is all we ever need. When we meditate on how great He is, we become transformed into His likeness as we are face-to-face -face in adoration of Him. This morning, as we gather around these emblems and you partake of them, stop and think and praise God for who He is and what He has done for each and every one of us. And remember that just because He is in heaven, He is actually closer than what we think. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Son. We thank You for the love that You give us. Lord, we just praise You for the awesome God that You are and just for always being there for us and being a God who we can come to and an approach at any time through our prayers. Lord, we ask that you be with us as we partake of these emblems, that they would help to remind us who you are, and as our creator, that we would give you back your due and just to lift you up on the most high. Lord, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for giving him up to die for us, that we may know we have a promise that we will be with you in heaven. Lord, be with each of those that we take. Bless them this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name.
Thank you so much for the privilege we have to seek you in prayer. But we as believers need to realize, and sometimes we, we lose sight of this, prayer is such a privilege to know that you are our Heavenly Father. And as a, a child of you, we have the right to come before you no matter what is on our minds, no matter the burden or the difficulty, and we present it to you, and you so willingly listen to us and guide us and direct us. Father, as we seek to, to learn this prayer together in these, these next weeks, may we just have open hearts and minds and be prepared to be transformed and be plugged in to prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many electronic devices today, as you all know, whether it's in the kitchen or the living room, they have to be plugged in to work. Uh, there has to be an outlet. That's why there's electrical outlets for, for these devices to be powered and, and to generate and, and to work however they're supposed to. But we also know that there are exceptions. There are some items that can work not being charged in. Our cell phones, right? Your, your iPhones, your, your Kindles, and your Nooks. Uh, those are digital books for some of you who may be uh, not using that. We have, uh, we're so lazy to open the pages we have to put. And then Kindles are cool, by the way. That's not knocking them. That's all roll your eyes. But uh, we know laptops also. But understand that even though these devices can run without being plugged in, only for a short period of time. An iPhone is said to have, uh, be able to run for almost 40 hours uh, before the battery dies down completely and it doesn't work. Because eventually, if you're not plugged in to a power source, you are going to, to, to be drained. Any electrical device without having the battery charged isn't going to work after a period of time. The most advanced, the most detailed, the most expensive, elaborate electronic devices cannot run by themselves forever. And I want us to know this morning, what can be said about electronic devices can also be said about us as believers. You see, we can't expect to live a Christian life, especially in a world that we are surrounded by darkness, we are surrounded by temptation and immorality and bad influence. We can't expect to thrive and live a life that's pleasing to God as He calls us to without being plugged into God through prayer. We have to be plugged into our source our strength, our power outlet, if you would, to draw what we need to live a life pleasing to Him. Prayer means that we must be plugged in to God. I mentioned in prayer, it is such a wonderful privilege. We tell people all the time, prayer is, is powerful, right? Prayer works. But I think we're all guilty sometimes of underestimating the importance of just communing with God on a daily basis. Now, we've got down pat our things that we need answered from God. Uh, things that we need God to provide for right away. But just thanking Him, talking with Him is so important. Seeking Him daily. And as powerful and as effective as prayer is, and as much as we say that, we as a people tend to neglect it a lot more than we should. You see, much like that cell phone that's not plugged in or that laptop that doesn't get charged frequently, we as Christians will run down spiritually. <clears throat> Many who are not plugged into prayer find themselves trying to live life the best they can, and one thing after another brings them down to the point where they are spiritually drained and they do not want to go on any more. You see, we have to be plugged in to prayer to be able to communicate with God. Plugged into our power source, and prayer is our outlet. This is the Lord's Prayer, commonly called by many. But we also know it to be the disciples' prayer or the model prayer. In Luke 11, verse 1, we also see Jesus in a condensed version. The Gospel writer Luke gives this passage of Scripture, much like when you read the Harmony in the Gospels. A different Gospel writer gives a different take on the passage. But Matthew's the most popular. You walk into any funeral home, uh, in any place, even places where God is not given much credit, they know this. Whether they've been taught or they've heard it, this is a very popular passage for many people. And Jesus gives his disciples the model to pray. That's what I want you to keep in mind. Many people think this is the only way to pray. No. Jesus says this then is how you should pray. Because he wanted to present to his disciples the importance of making sure you are taking the time to spend daily with God. Seek him. Talk with him. Be connected to him. Christ's entire ministry was driven by prayer. 
We read throughout the Gospels in most pivotal moments, moments where you and I would claim victory and be happy and excited. Christ withdrew from the crowds and went by himself to pray to the Father. Because he had a mission. He had the will to do of, of God to die for our sins. Jesus prayed everywhere. Probably before meals. Uh, often by himself with disciples, groups of people, prayer was important to him. And he prayed concerning all the needs and the interests of his life. And on top of that, Jesus prayed for the conversion of many people. In Matthew 23, he stands above the crowd. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you as a chick gathers her hands, but you would not come to me. You weren't willing. He prayed for evangelism. He prayed for daily needs. He spoke with God daily. He was plugged into the Father. We know the mission Jesus had to go to Calvary. The cross was in his sights. His entire life on earth as he performed the miracles and taught valuable lessons that we have in scripture to make sure the will of the Father was completed. But he could not do that without prayer. Even in the moments where Jesus was physically exhausted, our Savior, who could, felt like he didn't want to go on anymore, prayer kept him going when we see him in the garden. As he is about ready to die for the sins of the world. If at it, all possible, Father. Let the cup pass from me. But if not, let your will be done. As God's people, we need to be highly resolved to be committed to prayer. To give prayer the place that God wants it to have in our lives. To speak with Him and commune with Him and seek Him daily for all of our needs. Especially when we see the kind of life we're called to live. The next four weeks we are looking at this prayer. And it's divided into two main sections. And the first section is what we look at this morning. The first is centering on God. God's place in our life. Acknowledging who He is and what He's done for us. And giving Him the priority that not only does He deserve, but He demands. God demands it because He has created you and I. Whether the world acknowledges God or not, He, one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's going to get the honor and glory that's due Him. May we humble ourselves before Him and give it. Out of the fact that he's loved us so much, you see. And Jesus gave God priority in his life, center in his heart. And that's verses 9 and 10. But the rest of the verses, verses 11 through 13, focus on our needs. We think of mind, body, and soul, and spirit. The needs that we have not only for daily provision or forgiveness, but also the needs of others. Christ uh, prayed not only as he, he was putting God at the center of his life, but how he conducted his life daily. How we interact with each other. God has created us not only to be in a relationship with Him, but with each other. Do we pray for the salvation of others? Are we committed to the prayer list when we think this person, we pray daily, and we put them on the list, and we think, yeah, they're on the list, we'll pray for them in a general way. But are we committed to prayer about souls that, that, that are lost? Hearts that need to be rededicated. Jesus targets all human behavior and character and reminds us in this prayer that we are ever so reliant on God. There's not a day when we can be dependent from Him. So I want us this month to look at four ingredients, if you would, <coughs> that I believe Jesus presents to us as He does His disciples to help us develop a habit of prayer. So that you and I as believers, this church, not just individuals, but this congregation can be plugged in to God through prayer. That's what our theme is. And we're going to do some things together and, and challenge you to really be committed to doing just that. But the first ingredient, and probably the most important, that often gets uh, kind of overlooked by us, is adoration. Adoration to our Lord. Look at verses 9 and 10 again there in Matthew 6, and notice what Jesus says. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Three parts of those two verses I want us to break down together. Kind of a synopsis of what the scripture is. Exegetically, that's a big word. Use it this week. Just throw it on somebody. You're like, what are you talking about now? Uh, the first is this. Notice the first part of verse 9. He says, our Father in heaven. Christ says this then is how you should pray. The first ingredient to Jesus' prayer life was making sure God is praised. 
And in adoration, as Ken mentioned, it is a reverence to God. God is so great. And, and we think of him as so transcendent and sovereign and far away, but he is so intimately involved in our daily lives. He is here right now. It's just a matter of having an open heart to allow him to work and feel his presence, you see. But when two or more gathered in his name, there I am, our Father says. He addressed God as Father. As a child approaches a loving father, he or she knows that the father will give careful attention to what the request is, knowing that the Father will answer. It may not be the answer that you like, but the loving Father will take the time to listen, and, and, and if a need is met, if it needs to be met, he will do his very best to do so. But Jesus tells us to approach God the very same way. John 1.12 tells us this, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We have a right this morning. We have the privilege as believers. If you are here this morning and you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you've accepted him as your Savior, you've been immersed, and you've come out of those baptismal waters, you've been obedient to the gospel, we have the privilege to call upon him as our Heavenly Father. There are many in this world today that know about God, know of God, can recite to you backwards and forwards God's word, but they do not know him as a Heavenly Father as a child because they're not marked by Christ. You see, there's a big difference in knowing God and being in a relationship with him. We have the privilege to call him our Heavenly Father. That intimacy God has uh, uh, provided for us to have, our sonship, is the greatest privilege that we have as a son to a father. And Christ has provided that for us. 1 John 3, 1, uh, John writes, How great is the love of the Father that he's lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Praise God for that privilege. What a great love that God has for you and I when we clearly do not deserve it. Let's be honest. We didn't deserve such love. We're sinners. We deserved penalty. We deserved consequences. Oh, for the love of God that he stepped in and is lavished upon us. As Jesus begins this prayer, he uses the name Abba, or Father, which probably shocked the disciples. Jesus really rocked the boat with his teaching. Uh, it was not as, as rigid as the law. Christ came to provide something new. The disciples thought, you're not supposed to acknowledge God that way. The, the religious leaders of the day were so overtaken that this man who claims to be the Son of God would call upon God as Father. What an insult, they thought. So much so, they accused him of blasphemy and sent him to the cross to die. That they eventually crucified him. That this Jesus would refer to himself as God's son. Call upon God as, as, as father. But we have that privilege as believers this morning. And I believe when we think of adoration, it really sets the tone for the entire prayer that we give to God. To start right off the bat and just thank God for being God. Jesus acknowledged God's fatherly love. We begin our prayers to God. Our attention uh, is focused on the one to whom we're praying. Isn't it easy to go to prayer and then you think about 40 different things you're doing and then you realize, what in the world did I just say? There's a thing about what you got to do, where you eat, work, and it's so easy to become distracted. Just recognizing who God is sets the tone for us to have complete attention on a Heavenly Father who just desires for us to sit down and chat. Think of your dad's. And as they got older, how just much they just wanted to just talk with you. And just family members in general. That's God. God's like, you, you got a little time to sit down and talk with me? I mean, you know, I've created you in, in my image. I, I've kind of redeemed you. Can you fit me in your schedule? He wants to commune with us. But we're also reminded of God's identity when we set the tone of our prayer with the praise to God. In 2 Corinthians 6.18, Paul writes this, and he's quoting a passage from the Old Testament. I will be a father to you. This is God's words to his people Israel. And it's a promise for him. He says, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. When God says something, he means it. There's no hesitancy. There's no uncertainty. God says, you will be my sons and daughters. I will love you unconditionally, as filthy sinners as we are. 
when we accept his grace, God says, my arms are wide open and I love you. What a privilege that we can call him a heavenly father. But not only did Jesus encourage that relationship of trust, but I want you to know, it meant so much to Jesus that he died a horrible death to purchase that right to call God a heavenly father for all of us to have. That's how important Jesus saw this, that we have privilege to be called children of God. He died for us to have that right. And we give him adoration and we give him praise because he deserves it. He is a holy God. He is worthy of praise. You see, Jesus says, our Father in heaven. And the next part there in verse 10 says, hallowed be your name. Or rather, at the end of verse 9, I should say, hallowed be your name. In his own prayer life, Jesus gave respect to God, a reverence. To hollow means to honor as holy or sacred. That, that God deserved such acknowledgement. When we pray, we enter the presence of God with a reverence, with a worship, with a thanksgiving. Thanking him for who he is and, and what he's done for us and what he's promised us. Thanking him that as messed up as this world is. As crummy as this world is, you get your dinner together and you sit in front of the television at 5 o'clock and you stop eating. That's how bad this world is. It's like, really? I don't want to finish. Thanks. I'm good. That's a good diet. Just watch what's going on around the world. I'll pass. That as bad and as uncertain as things are, as much that, that changes around us, the one certain thing we have is the promise we have in eternal life. How often do we stop and just thank God for salvation? Thank you for giving me a better way of life. Thank you for dying for my sins. Giving me the hope that is eternal. Many of the psalmists, and David writing many of the psalms, always uh, gave mention and thanked God for being God. In Psalm 99, verse 9, I love what David writes. He says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. We worship God not just in prayer. How you live your life daily? I mean, a lot of people think prayer is when we sit down and we kneel and we go. How many of you pray on the way to work? How many of you pray when your kids are just bothering you and you think, don't let me kill them, Father, please. I do not want to go to jail. Give me patience, you know. We, do, we, we pray in the hospital. We, we pray in traffic. We pray at the work desk or where we're at. We just say, God wants us to be in constant communication with him. It's a privilege we have. Take advantage of it. But thank God for being God. Respect who he is. Come to his holy mountain, David says, and praise him. We gather together on Sunday mornings because we know the emphasis that God places upon fellowship with believers. That we are surrounded by people of like faith that gather together to praise God for who he is. And I go back to 1 John 3, 1. As the gospel writer it, it, it writes, John says, how great is the love he's lavished upon us. That word means it's just overwhelming. We're spoiled. We are spoiled brats. That, that God has loved us so much when we clearly didn't deserve it, and his grace is abundant. His mercy is overflowing. We can't get enough of our Lord. God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. In other words, he's all-present, he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful. And he loves us and he watches over us. And he gives us good gifts. Now in the Jewish culture traditionally, and some Jews today still don't, will not write the name of God. They never said it. And they never wrote the name of God. Yahweh was the word used. Jehovah. Because to say God's name would not be treating it holy. God was so holy that they could not speak his name. That was what the Jewish tradition was. Mark E. Moore writes that when we think of Judaism... Whereas Judaism, by overemphasizing God's transcendence, that made God untouchable, that God's way up there, we're down here. But at the same time, we think of what is called evangelicalism today. That's, that's people just lump everybody that believes in God together. When we think of what we think of in, in, in terms of evangelicalism, we overemphasize the nearness of God so much that we have permitted irreverence. There's a seesaw, folks. It's balanced. It needs to be made. Yes, God is all-knowing, all and he is, he's transcendent and sovereign, but he deserves respect. Yes, God is near. God is here right now. God 
God is present and active and involved in our lives. Whether it's upcoming surgeries, treatments, unspoken requests, family difficulties, financial difficulties, the list goes on and on of things God is present and abiding in our lives. We have the privilege to know that when we come out of these waters, we are given the Holy Spirit. And God dwells with us. And as near as he is, if he is, near as he is, say that three times fast. We need to stop and praise him for being such a mighty God. That as mighty as he is, he is so present in our lives. Our Heavenly Father is near and approachable, but we got to respect him. He's not a daddy. He's not the big guy upstairs. He's not this some kind of cosmic Santa Claus that we bring our Christmas wish list to and he answers it suddenly. God deserves a little bit more respect than what many believers give him today. Hallowed be your name. Now Exodus 20 verse 7 is one of the Ten Commandments that says, Thou shalt not use the Lord uh, the name of the Lord in vain, right? Don't curse the name of God. Oh, we see it thrown around so much on television and music. But, but I believe... We shouldn't just limit it to cursing his name when we think of, of the misuse of God's name. But what about our attitudes of the heart? A lack of respect or indifference by one who professes love for God is just as much a sin. That when we go about our daily lives and we never stop to acknowledge who God is, it's just as bad as cursing his name in vain. It's the attitude of the heart. Where is our heart when we enter the presence of God? That it's not just prayer, but it's the way we live that shows a reverence to who God is. Jesus encouraged his followers to give adoration to God. To use God's name in an honorable way for a purpose that deepens our relationship with him. Our Heavenly Father is worthy of worship. And we begin our prayers that way. Because understand, all that you have is not because of what you've done. Because what God has done. Every talent that you have is God-given. Every resource that, that you have uh, come across in your life is God-given. Every possession you have, the roof over your head, the food on the table, what you've been provided for is because God's wonderful hand of grace has given it to you. And we must never, ever think otherwise. We thank God for the comforts we have in life because all good things come from our Heavenly Father. So when you enter the presence of God, just stop for a couple of minutes and just praise Him. Adore Him. And I want you to know that the moment we have that idea of, of giving God what is due Him, our whole spirit of life changes. Our whole way of thinking changes. Uh, our, our agendas become much more God-centered than the way they were prior. We prepare ourselves to listen to the Lord. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That leads us to the third part of what Jesus gives as adoration. He says the following verse 10. Your, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Jesus begins this prayer with adoration. It is so important to recognize that God is in control of it. And that God has all authority in all matters of life. He has supreme power and authority to answer prayer. Everything in heaven and on earth is given His authority. And as part of the Lord's Prayer, we ask God's will to take place on this earth. <coughs> we have elections upcoming. May we pray for God's will to be done. I don't care what party you represent. That's not the matter I have. It's just praying that God's will is done on this earth. That leaders seek Him in wisdom. That family members that we have, we think of the will being done in our family. Decisions made, may God's will be, be, be taken. And we pray for His will to be done. And the hard thing about doing that is sometimes God puts us where we don't want to do. May your will be done, just not that far. I had something else in mind. That's a, that's a risky prayer. Because if we're committed in our hearts to pray that, He's going to put us places where we didn't think we'd be before. But that's the greatness about God. He gives us what we need to, to accomplish that. And bring glory to his name. Jesus constantly prayed that God's will would be done on earth as he performed miracles. Moments where he could have performed miracles, he said, this is not the will of God. It's not my time. Moments where they thought, this is the moment we overthrow the kingdom, Jesus. The disciples got together. This is where, this is not God's will. 
as Peter drew the sword and cut off Malchus's ear. He says, Peter, just, just take a step back, though. Take a deep breath. This is not God's will. This is how things are going to do. We pray for God's will to take place in our own lives and in the lives of others around us, in situations and in, in the world, in circumstances we see. We too pray, as Christ prayed, marching to the cross. We too pray in every aspect of our daily lives that God's will is met and accomplished. He says, your kingdom come. This is the sovereignty of God. We recognize his sovereignty. We affirm and welcome his reign in our lives. That's the problem many people have today when it comes to accepting Christ as Savior. You like all that forgiveness stuff. Nobody wants to go to hell, but I've got to make him Lord of my life. That means I lose control of how I live and I've got to do things his way. I have a master. He is Lord and Savior. The one whom we call Jesus Christ. His kingdom come. His reign in our lives. And we promise as believers when we recognize His, his reign in our lives to live in a way that, that pleases Him, that honors Him. And understand this, God's kingdom has already been established. Many people believe today that, you know, there's coming a day when Christ will return, and here on earth he's going to establish his kingdom for a thousand years. Um, his kingdom was established the moment when Jesus said, it is finished on the cross. It was done. There's no other addition to it. We, as believers today, are a part of the kingdom of God living on this earth until Christ returns. Amen. And we have a job to bring as many people as we possibly can to do the same, to be a member of the kingdom, to, to be makers of disciples. Kingdom workers furthering God's kingdom on this earth. That what this church does and says, what it plans to do, what it seeks to do in outreach, that in every way, shape, or form, it is bringing glory and honor to the one who reigns supreme. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is the Great Commission. It wasn't just given to the disciples. A lot of people tell you that one. We too are called to carry that commission out. That his will is done. That, that souls, that souls are saved. How committed are we to praying for a mom or dad, a brother or sister, a coworker or a dear friend who doesn't know Christ? How willing are we to pray daily that they are saved? Because you probably talk to them until you're blue in the face and they don't want to listen. Hand over to God. May the Spirit work in the lives of individuals that they know who Christ is. We recognize and embrace his reign in our lives. And by committing that, understand we, in essence, are saying, Father, use me to help bring about that change. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We must, as believers, pray for God's will to be our Break our heart for what breaks yours. That is a, a phrase in a very popular song on the radio. Well, what does that mean? That, that means that we stop playing games. We stop coming to church just to show up. We, start, we stop worshiping just to say we sing songs. It's a normal thing to do. But we are committed daily to say, I want to have a heart that Christ has. And when we do so, it changes things drastically. That we have a heart that breaks. Just as he does when he sees someone who's lost someone helpless, or someone in need, who just needs a little a kind word to say, or mercy, or forgiveness. Break our heart for cooperation. His will must be our will. And we pray to be in line with that. God calls his children to live rightly, but to do good to others. What's the two greatest commands? Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, strength. Let your name raise yourself. Boy, if we did that, we'd be in good shape, because a lot of people love themselves too much. <laughs> to do good to others. Caring for, the, uh, caring for those around us as much as we care for ourselves. In Psalm 143.10, the psalmist writes, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. Prayer, when we are committed to it, when we are plugged into prayer, when we're plugged into God and communicating with Him daily and seeking Him daily, it changes our priorities. Oftentimes, prayer may change our circumstances to where, wow, God really brought me out of that. Well, wow, I'm doing something I didn't think I'd be doing the month before. But more importantly, it changes who we are as people, our priorities. We become God-centered. And as I mentioned earlier, we may be praying just as Christ in the garden. 
sometimes bad, sometimes emotionally drained for what we see. Emotionally drained maybe for that loved one who doesn't look Christ. Or that family who's struggling and you wish you could do everything you can for them. May your will be done. Guys, as we as we continue this upon looking at this passage of scripture, just, just five verses, verses 9 to 13. We need to understand, not just as individual believers, but as a new being of church of Christ, not just what we do inside these doors. And listen, this is great. We want to update our you know, sanctuary. We want to keep some people coming. They just stay. You know? we want to... but, but what happens when outside these doors? What this church does to, to reach a soul for Jesus Christ. That we become committed to pray. That we become plugged in to our source of power. I don't want you to come these four weeks just to come and say, oh, you're right, you need to be plugged in. I want to challenge all of this. And that is what we're going to do. But I want you to know this. Our God, and we're going to sing this song as our invitation to Our God is an awesome God. Do you understand that? Amen? Amen. Our God is an awesome God. And He is worthy of praise. He deserves praise. Demands it for being who God is. <coughs> Jesus shows us the importance of prayer. How we ought to pray in the very first thing before we hit our knees or close our eyes or, or pray wherever it is we are. We better give God what's due. And thank Him for being such a mighty God. Because I want you to know this as people, individual hearts, and as this church as a whole, it is not possible to pray for our full potential until we offer Lord. We offer our God what His right name is. I'll say that again. We cannot pray for God to move mighty, mightily through this congregation and pack the pews and reach the, the, the community. We cannot pray for those things. We cannot pray for everything to be greater in our individual lives until we first recognize who God is and give Him what is rightly due. Our God is an awesome God, our Father in Heaven. Hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we are humble this morning. We come before your presence humbly, knowing who we are. That, that we are sinners merely saved by your grace. As messed up, as, as filthy as sin makes us, you have loved us so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. So that not only do we have the hope of eternal life, but when we think of prayer, we have the privilege to be your children, sons and daughters, and call upon you no matter what is on our hearts as our heavenly Father. May we never take it for granted. May we understand what a wonderful privilege this is. And Father, as we come before you this morning, we realize that you deserve our praise. You demand it. You're worthy because you are such an awesome God. And Jesus, always in prayer, recognized that. And if this church expects to do anything in your name, if we as believers, individual Christians, expect to, to live a life pleasing to you and do anything in your name, then we better recognize that too. And we give you the adoration you deserve. Thank you, Father. For this privilege of prayer, thank you for being such an awesome God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand this morning. And we're going to sing together page 179. And we're going to sing together how God awesome, God, our awesome our God is. And I hope you sing out. And my prayer... <coughs> Is it starting right now, starting today, we give God what is, what is due Him. That we praise God for being not just God, but our Heavenly Father. That privilege that's there. And my prayer this morning is if you're here and maybe God's working on your heart. 
He's nudging a little bit. He's nudged a couple of weeks. Now he's knocking a little more. And you hear the message and your heart's a little open. You think, wow, I, I know the need I have and that conviction's there. You know what he's calling you? He's calling you saying, I want, I want to be your heavenly father too. Don't miss that. Make that decision because it's the most important decision you'll make. We're going to sing how awesome God is this morning. Let's sing out as, as we sing together this invitation. Pencils, all right? 
Uh, but uh, we need it. We need a lot of help. And, and he's mentioned if you don't feel like going out shopping and want to donate a little bit of cash, uh, it, it will go to a great need. We, we certainly want to do things differently this year as we turn turn our parking lot into a village of that land. Uh, so we need volunteers too, especially. But uh, his next Sunday, what is the next trunk or treat meeting? Sunday. Next Sunday at 5 o'clock, correct? So if you are wanting to help out next Sunday, the 14th, 5 p.m., make an effort to be here. As, as Ken and Steph will give you the rundown of what we're doing and, and those already signed up. We need some workers, hands-on in all kinds of areas, but we really hope to, to, to have a good turnout. These past two years have been amazing how many kids have come through. So uh, we, we pray for, for good things to be done there. Um, tonight, 6.30 is our evening service. Please make an effort to, to be out as, as we, we worship together. And uh, keep me in your prayers, October the 21st the 23rd, just evenings. Uh, I'm doing a revival at the May Hill Church of Christ. Some of you wondering, where's May Hill? I don't know where it is either. <laughs> uh, no. But it is south of, right, where, where is it, you know? She didn't know. I don't know, it's great. Uh, but it's, it's south of Hillsboro somewhere. But, uh... I'm going to be preaching a revival there. Dan Clark, some of you may know, older folks know Dan Clark. Uh, so uh, he gave me a call. So I'm, I'm very blessed to, to be a part of that. So just uh, pray for them. They're a smaller church, and they just they just want to be revived. There's a lot of things going on there, and it's good. And it's a good opportunity to, to, to help them. They really ran out of people to ask. Um, <laughs> went down the list. Everybody was busy. So. Uh, but just a lot of things going on. And, just thank you for being here this morning. To all our visitors, uh, God bless you for being here, and we'd love to have you at any time. But uh, it, it, with that being said, there is nothing else. Yes, I'm sorry. Right after church, if anybody can help us unload Brad's pickup truck in the garage, um, just head on out to the garage and get that unloaded. Yeah, and too, that leads me to another thing. Yes, well, Brad is so kind as to kind of building us a makeshift village, if you would, for, for Bethlehem. I know in the couple years they've just kind of done, you know, little spots like creation. Thing. This is a village. Kind of the one main thing, bringing the birth of life, uh, Christ to life. So if you can help, guys, uh, we need some muscle. To, that excludes me. So please make sure you can stick around real quick for that. And also, tomorrow, uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock, men, or women, you want to help do this vibe. But men, if you can please make an effort to be here. We're going to try to get these pews out of here tomorrow. So if you have some time, please, we need all the help uh, we can get. So, so be aware of that, uh, too. What is that? Busy Bees Pink Party, right? And that is next Tuesday. This Tuesday. Tuesday, 6.30. So as every year the ladies do something. This is uh, scarves and hats for uh, Boy Cancer Unit. And what a, a great uh, great thing that is. And, and ladies, we encourage you to be a part of that, uh, especially as they kind of uh, do, do their thing. So, so thank you so much for that. If you plan on attending, please sign up uh, there. Having uh, said that, uh, Royce, would you close a little bit of prayer for Lord God, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning, Lord. As we know we have a great spectrum, Lord. Lord, we look forward to having Sunday soon. Lord, we know that prayer is a big part of our personal lives. We know you call us, Lord, to pray on a daily basis. We give you the honor and glory and praise and adoration of you. Let's pray that we're going to be challenged to pray daily. Here it is.